Okay, so let's um, let's just talk a little bit about uh, Zoom before we um, get into class today. Um, so most of these things are pretty straightforward. Uh, being on time is important, uh, just like any class. We want to uh, make sure we show up in time. And uh, you can always sign on to the meeting early. You can sign on to the meeting 45 minutes early, even if that started, at least you're, you're in. And uh, I don't have to let you in when class has already started. Um, be respectful. So in all your interactions, just like in normal class, we want to be respectful. You know, use nice words and wait our turn and, and all those kind of things. Um, dress appropriately. So I have your, um, when you sign on, um, your microphone and your uh, camera are going to be automatically turned off. But that being said, um, you are in class and you should be dressing appropriately. I mean, we don't want a scenario where somebody is accidentally turning on their camera and they're sitting there in their bathrobe or less, or you're not wearing pants or, or who knows. Uh, uh, and never mind people in your background. Um, maybe you have a parent or a spouse or something walking around in a bathrobe in the background, you know, all those kind of things. Or we just don't want to have that. So just think about your surroundings, dress appropriately, and uh, we won't have to worry about anything like that. Uh, so your microphone, like I said, is gonna be muted. Want to make sure that uh, you keep it muted unless you have a question, uh, because otherwise we'll hear every sniffle and cough and heavy breathing and you know clinking of coffee cups and all those kind of things. Uh, but feel free to unmute and ask a question if you, if you have anything to say or uh, share uh, or if, you know, something's not working in terms of what I'm doing, like uh, I'm not sharing my screen or something like that, let me know. And uh, I will have the chat function enabled here, so you can always ask me any questions and I'll try to answer them uh, eventually. So uh, you can use that chat function for that purpose. And then like any class, come prepared to learn uh, because of course that's what we're here for. So I'm probably not going to uh, have my videos enabled uh, for most of the time just to save some screen space. But what we want to do is get in things. And uh, last day we were talking about the helmets. So uh, we talked about the flatworms. You know, the flatworms include, of course, the, uh, the tapeworms and the, uh, the flukes. So we have a few more things to talk about in terms of these uh, parasites. And so the next group we want to talk about are the nematodes. Nematodes are non-segmented roundworms. And to introduce the nematodes, I have a clip from SpongeBob. So who doesn't like SpongeBob? I'll play that for you. Still hungry. 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 Oh, dang, nematodes. Anyway, cute little video. Uh, they haven't quite, quite drawn the nematodes properly because you may notice they're supposed to be non-segmented. Uh, but anyway, who doesn't like SpongeBob? So let's just talk a little bit about uh, some of these things. These are um, often known as worms, and there's many types, maybe 90,000 or something like that. And... Um, they include uh, things like earthworms. And uh, so when we say free living, I mean, they live out in the wild, in the dirt or, or whatever. And many are parasites of animals and, and whatnot. And uh, there's a whole bunch that infect humans. Uh, we're just gonna focus in on three examples. Uh, two of them are a little bit more exotic and uh, one of them is, uh, is, is very common infection. So let's take a look at these. We have uh, the enterobiasis, Bookworms and Ascaris. So, by the way, I have some numbers here. You can see that uh, I guess I've already showed you these numbers, didn't I? In the first, um, first. Uh, okay, yeah. For some reason, I have two slides that looks like I made that are of the exact same amount of information. So we'll just skip that one. So let's talk about the first one: these pinworms. And uh, so these pinworms, uh, you may have heard of these uh, if you're a parent or maybe uh, you were a child and had them. Uh, these are tiny little worms. They look like pins 
And they're very, very common type of infection. And I'll talk about how common in a moment. Uh, but basically, they're living um, in, the, uh, in the digestive system. And uh, so uh, they live down there. Um, the eggs come out in the anus. Uh, they can cause irritation and itchiness uh, as, the, uh, as the worms sometimes come out. And the, uh, the eggs will spread by, uh, by usually fingers to mouth kind of thing. And, uh, you know, very, very common amongst kids. You can imagine, you know, just in terms of washing hands and those kind of things. And um, I think I mentioned before, a lot of these worms' eggs are very, very sticky. Uh, so even with hand washing, uh, sometimes the eggs can persist. And uh, so this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, usually for a diagnosis, a uh, doctor may ask, uh, you know, if, you, if this is your child, they may say, okay, you know, when your child is ready for bed, uh, you know, just get a little piece of, um, of sticky tape, so some scotch tape and and you know you apply it on the um, on the anus, and 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 then they'll take a look and see if you've collected any worms there. So um, you know every once in a while I mention this, and um, uh, you know the the kind of funny thing is that uh, you know every once in a while somebody will say something like, "Wait a second, I remember," you know, and they have this memory, blurry memory of when they were young, and their parents were in their bed with a flashlight, and this is probably what was going on. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is super common infection. Uh, there has been some studies that seem to indicate that maybe 100% of us get this. Uh, if it's not 100%, it's very close. Uh, not everyone ends up with, uh, you know, getting diagnosed and, and, and whatnot. You know, kids end up with, with itchy bums all the time. And, and sometimes it goes away very quickly. Other times it causes ir irritation enough to you know, merit a visit to the doctor. But super common, uh, and there seems to be something about the physiology of a child versus an adult in that adults never get it. I mean, I think it's very rare. Some weird immunocompromised uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, may be the exception, but uh, something different with the chemistry of the digestive tract in adults versus kids. So it's something we all deal with, uh, whether you notice it or not, um, it, it's, it's probably happen to you and will probably happen to your kids, uh, whether it's a big deal or not um, is the real question. So I think there's a question there and says, somebody says, are they everywhere? Yes, they are everywhere. Uh, like I said, uh, there's studies that show that they seem to be everywhere that we look. And um, the data seems to indicate that uh, we all are victims to these worms at some point. So fun, fun but not usually serious. In fact, I'm not aware of any situation where these are serious at all, other than just um, irritation and itchiness. All right, let's take a look at another worm. Uh, this one is important geographically and has been important, very important historically. These are the hookworms. Uh, there's actually a couple different species of these. Uh, the common one that you find in the Americas is this one here, Nectar americanus. Um, <laughs> although it, it it's believed to actually originated from the African continent and brought over with the, uh, the transatlantic uh, slave trade. Um, these things are really scary looking. I think they look like something out of um, some sort of uh, horror movie or science fiction movie, but I, I think they're very interesting looking. So a little bit about these hookworms. Uh, you can see, first of all, they uh, look like hooks uh, and uh, there's actually a male and a female version and these things, uh, are also found in the digestive system. I think I have, uh, just a second here, let me just, okay, I thought I had the, uh, the life cycle, but I don't have the image of that, I don't know what happened to it, I must have accidentally cut it out. Uh, but basically the way these things work is they can live in the soil. Uh, so the life cycle starts, um, somebody defecates, and, uh, and the worms live in the feces. They can live for a few days out in the wild, not very long. I think it's five days or something like that. And, uh, and then you can imagine you have a scenario where, uh, you know, somebody is walking along either near it or whatever, and the worms can actually burrow into skin. So in many uh, tropical developing countries, um, this is really common. You have, uh, you have children running around bare feet. Uh, maybe sanitation isn't, isn't as good as it is in Canada. And uh, so there's the risk and the worm goes in the skin and it kind of has this weird part of the life cycle where it goes in and so you can imagine it goes in the skin and then it ends up in the, um, in the circulatory system, in the blood. 
And what it wants to do is find its way to your digestive system. And uh, this is kind of gross, but what it does is the easiest way to do that is basically follow the blood all the way back to the lungs. And then it migrates out of the lungs into the back of the throat and then goes down the esophagus. And this is a super common kind of way for these worms to find their way to digestive tracts. Um, so usually the person doesn't know, every once in a while somebody uh, finds them in their mouth, it's, it's kind of gross, and uh, I'll talk about that in another minute. But kind of the bottom line is here we have another uh, organism, and it has, uh, it's spread by a uh, basic, basic lack of, of sanitation, um, human fecal matter. And, uh, you know, its, it's life cycle is, is unique, and it's, uh, like I said, a little bit more geographically um, uh, uh, found in, in places where sanitation is an issue. Used to be huge, hugely common in the uh, United States, particularly in the southern United States, um, where there were more kids running around bare feet. And uh, once we start to understand the life cycle of this and find treatments, um, you know, more wealthier countries have kind of uh, gotten rid of it. So but I think these things are very, very terrifying. Uh, so someone's asking, should we memorize the term hookworm or nectar americanus? Um, hookworm is mostly what I'm going to use for talking about this one. Um, there are a couple of other um, uh, species that, that are considered hookworms. So for this one here, I, I wouldn't worry about the scientific name, just know the word um, hookworm. So good question. So one more I just want to share with you is the Ascaris lumbricoides. Uh, so this one here you should know by, um, by the genus name. So you, you should know this word Ascaris. And uh, sometimes people call it the giant intestinal uh, roundworm. And so again, you have another situation where you have human fecal matter. And typically this is a scenario where the human fecal matter is used to fertilize crops. And so the eggs end up uh, in vegetables or, or whatever people are eating and, uh, and you got the, um, and people are ingesting the, uh, ingesting the eggs. So that's what it looks like. I'll have some other pictures for you here in a moment. It kind of looks like an earthworm. It's about the size of a skinny uh, big pen. Uh, and uh, they come in a couple of different colors. Sometimes they're sort of browner, sometimes they're a little bit more yellow, uh, kind of almost look like yellow beans in some ways. Uh, here's the life cycle. You can see that it's basically the person ingesting the eggs and, uh, and uh, it goes uh, into the gut. Um, so you can see this other note though, it says here the larvae uh, go to the gut. And I don't really know why exactly they do this, but uh, since they're already in the gut, you think they would be happy, but for some reason they often will migrate to the lungs and then back into the intestines. And this seems to be a pretty common uh, thing with a lot of these parasites. I don't really understand it very well. I'm not sure if anybody does, um, but like I said, uh, finding the lungs is a pretty easy way to get yourself back to the digestive system. And so that's one way uh, to do it. So these ones here, um, let me just go back to the hookworm. I guess I forgot to mention about the hookworm, you know, what the big deal is with the hookworm. Um, one thing about the hookworm is um, it'll cause people to be anemic. It, will, uh, it takes a lot of iron from the blood and it can cause um, some severe anemia. And uh, that's one of the biggest concerns about hookworms, particularly uh, children in developing countries. And anemia can be pretty debilitating. It can affect things like your IQ and whatnot if you are uh, uh, getting repeatedly infected all the time. Uh, the Ascaris, on the other hand, um, isn't doing quite as much. Uh, you can be infected up to, you know, maybe up to 100 worms and not really have a lot of symptoms. Uh, it's when you sort of get to 100 or maybe 200 where you might start end up with intestinal blockage. And that's kind of the big deal with these. Um, I think I showed you in the, on, on one of the previous slides that there's probably a billion people uh, or more. I know I saw one statistic that said 2 billion people. I don't know if that's true. Who knows? I mean, we're not testing everybody. are infected worldwide. And so most of these people are living just fine. Like I said, it's kind of when you get up to the higher numbers where you can end up with um, some issues. So intestinal blockage, of course, is, it is not fun and um, it can be quite significant. Um, here are some more. So just warning you that, uh, you know, there's some, some kind of gross pictures here. Uh, and um, so they can, uh, they can get these worms up by giving people drugs and um, they can, uh, 
So it says here, does anyone else have a large dark square block in part of the PowerPoint? That might be the chat box. Hmm. Maybe I'll just exit that. I don't know if that's better or not. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing different from Zoom as I was last year. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll show you some more pictures. You can, you can take a drug that can paralyze the worms and the worms uh, actually will just, will just come out uh, uh, with the person's stool. And uh, I was gonna show you this picture here. This is a um, uh, parasitologist who went to a village in Bangladesh and um, gave each child a single pill and uh, because he's a parasitologist, he collected all the worms. So this was about 100 children's worth of worms. So <laughs> I guess this is what you do if you're a parasitologist. So the drug they use, by the way, is ivernectin, um, which uh, you may or may not have heard of is in the news and people seem to think it, they're gonna uh, use it to, uh, to treat uh, um, COVID-19. It's a, it's a worm drug, it paralyzes worms. Uh, it's not exactly an antiviral and uh, there's a lot more I could say about that, but uh, don't take worm drugs to uh, treat viral infections is kind of the bottom line. So like I said, just some warning here for some grosser pictures. You can see this other note it says here, they can exit from the anus and then nose, mouth, or ears. Oh, that's horrifying. Um, so what's happening here? Um, so here's a, here's a dissection of a pig, uh, intestine you can see the worms in there uh, so people have these worms right you could have a couple dozen or a, a lot more uh, and like i said if, they, if you have intestinal blockage that's a significant issue and, and in some cases people require surgery to uh, to properly uh, fix this um, but uh, sometimes which is really common in developing countries uh, kids get sick from other things and so they get a fever and the worms do not like the fever and so that's when they start migrating this is where, um, so just alert uh, for some disturbing photos here. Um, oh, where is that photo there? Not sure what happened with that black box there, but it said disturbing photo alert. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the worms start migrating out and they, they go whatever direction they can. So out of the anus, sometimes they work their way up and end up coming out of uh, nose, mouth, and ears. So pretty horrifying, really. But um, you know, uh, not, not fun at all. All right, so a couple more things about nematodes. There are other nematodes. There's whipworms. Um, just trying to think of some of the other ones that are pretty common. That in fact, uh, in millions of people worldwide, there's a lot of a uh, lot more rare ones as well. And they, uh, uh, so I'm not going to cover them all. I just wanted to give you three examples. Now, the pinworm being uh, maybe the most relevant one for people in Canada. Uh, the other two common. Uh, in, in developing countries, so you may encounter them at some point. Uh, something interesting about worms that I'm just going to kind of just talk about for a second is that they have implications in our immune system. And it turns out that the same part of your immune system that uh, deals with uh, allergies is the same part of your immune system that deals with worms. So if you have some sort of allergic allergies or autoimmune disease or something like that, uh, it's the same part of your immune system that deals with worms. So people are trying to figure out, can we, you know, can we take advantage of this, right? And uh, so more on that later when we talk about the immune system, but uh, um, there was a group here, I was just reading about this study I wanted to share with you where they were looking at uh, Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune disease of the gut. And uh, so the whole idea was, um, you know, what if this person isn't infected by the worms? Um, that keeps the immune system busy uh, dealing with the worms and not attacking the gut. So it's not that ethical to give somebody and infect them with worms. Um, so what they did is they actually used a whipworm from sheep. So the whole idea is that the sheep whipworms, um, they put them in little, you know, little caplets or something like that. Uh, the sheep whipworms uh, can't infect humans. So basically you give the human, the sheep whipworm eggs, they hit the gut, they hatch, and then they die. And, uh, but our immune system recognizes something on them, some sort of molecule uh, and realizes it's a worm. And they're able to actually alleviate some symptoms of Crohn's disease. So I don't know if this has been done in a large trial yet or not, but uh, some interesting uh, things to, to consider. And like I said, I'll, I'll kind of talk about, um, we're gonna talk about the immune system a lot later. And uh, I think that's topic uh, 13 or something like that. 
All right, a little more SpongeBob for you. Thursday, 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 Thursday
And uh, there's other treatments out there, uh, special types of shampoos, and there's home remedies, and, and uh, all of those things aren't really going to do any harm. I think there's home remedies with the mayonnaise or something like that. Right? Somebody was telling me about, and, and um, they're not necessarily going to do any harm. You're applying it to external to the body. Uh, can cause itchiness and whatnot, and of course, uh, it can spread relatively easily if, it, if children are sharing things like brushes or, or hats or toots or anything like that. Um, so, you know, it's something that, that is kept track of in the, uh, in the school system because, of course, nobody wants a lice outbreak uh, in the school system. Um, just going back, uh, body lice is a bit more common in uh, uh, homeless people, uh, people that don't wash their clothes and things like that, and, and um, uh, can also get rid of uh, <laughs> mainly by getting clean clothes and doing the laundry kind of frequently. Uh, pubic lice is spread uh, typically sexually. Um, so pubic hair to pubic hair kind of thing. And uh, so it's a sexually transmitted uh, infection. So besides insects, uh, we also have uh, other arthropods. So mites, mites are not insects. Oopsies, go back here. So mites have eight legs. So they're a little more closely related to spiders. And there's a few mites out there. If you have uh, a pet, at some point your, your dog or cat might get some sort of mite. And there's a whole bunch of different species. I don't really know all of them. Uh, one species that does infect humans uh, from occasion is scabies. And uh, so um, I believe this is found in the soils in some places. I don't know if it's found this far north. Um, but I've, um, I've met some people that have had it. I don't know where they got it. I didn't, you know, try and ask a lot of questions, but basically these things are burrowing under the skin and they can, they can live there. And this causes irritation and itchiness and, you know, blistering and things like that. In some cases, people get allergic reactions to their feces, which can be, uh, can be a lot more serious. Uh, there are other mites out there. There's another one called chiggers, which uh, I don't know too much about. I think it's uh, found more in warmer places and whatnot, but uh, uh, you may have heard of scabies. Um, what about dust mites? So dust mites are found everywhere, uh, everywhere humans are found. Um, there's a couple of different species. Uh, if you're in Eurasia, Africa, uh, there's one species that's more common. If you're in the Americas, there's another species that's more common, but both do live in both places. And these things basically feed on dead skin, which is what your dust is, right? Your dust uh, we find around the house is dead skin and hair and a few other things, which is which is pretty gross, but that's what they're here for. Um, they they want to feed on that stuff, and uh, uh, they're they're found everywhere. Uh, and the more you think about it, the grosser it gets. They're found in your bed sheets and your pillows. They're found in uh, on your floor, and and they're um, they're not. These things are, are are big enough to be seen with the human eye, but they look like the smallest speck you could possibly imagine. And uh, I think everybody I know who's ever been allergy tested has found they're allergic to dust. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the dust, when, when we mean allergic to dust, we actually mean we're allergic to the, uh, the feces of these insects or of these, of these mites that's found uh, in the dust. Uh, so dust allergy is super common. Uh, there's things you can do. Uh, you can get uh, those special uh, sheets and, uh, and pillowcases that are, uh, are supposed to be you know, hypoallergenic. It means that uh, the mites can't get in between the, uh, the weavings. And, uh, but it's something most of us have to live with, I guess. Um, just more reason to clean your home, I suppose. All right, so we're pretty much done this unit. Um, another thing I want to mention about these ectoparasites is that many of them are vectors. So what do I mean by vector? A vector means something that spreads disease. So here's a few that uh, I think we've talked about many of these already. Uh, fleas, of course, spread the plague. Uh, lice, um, well, they, they cause us issues, but they do cause, um, they can spread some diseases. I'm just trying to think of some of them. Uh, one is called trench fever. I don't know if that has another name. I never really think about trench fever, but it spreads uh, some sort of uh, bacterial disease, which of course is was something people were getting in the trenches during the World Wars. Um, this is not... I don't know this. I'm looking at this one here because mites have eight legs. I don't know if these are extra legs up at the top. I don't know if actually mites actually spreading diseases. 
but ticks spread things like Lyme disease. The TC fly spreads uh, African sleeping sickness. African. Sleeping sickness. Mosquitoes, whole bunch of things spread by mosquitoes. We're talking about malaria, West Nile virus, um, chicken yunga, dengue fever, Zika. There's a whole bunch of uh, diseases spread by mosquitoes. And the, um, the true bugs or the kissing bugs, that was, of course, Chaga's disease. So stay, stay tuned. We're going to talk about some of these things a little in a little bit more detail. Uh, particularly, we're going to come back to mosquitoes and uh, and Lyme disease um, quite a bit because there are um, there's some things there that are uh, very very relevant to us in Canada and, and of course relevant worldwide. <laughs> Someone's making a comment. That we're going to feel itchy all day today. Well, uh, the good news is uh, it's getting cool and I haven't seen I actually haven't seen an insect in a while. Although actually the crazy thing is I'm seeing a lot of spiders. I don't know if they're trying to sneak into my house. So um, can we use these things, these insect things in therapy? Uh, this is another question, another news report I saw where uh, we were talking about, um, uh, when we were talking about bacteria, we were talking about these biofilms that can be found uh, on uh, these uh, uh, these chronic wounds and diabetics. And I was mentioning that they're really hard to treat these wounds because you got all this dead tissue, the bacteria living there in a biofilm, uh, hard, to, hard to permeate with the antibiotics. And so apparently you can, you can use maggots to um, uh, clean up these wounds. Uh, don't know too much about this. You can read that news article there a little bit, uh, but just something kind of interesting tidbit for you. All right, so we're gonna finish off here, uh, this unit with a case study. And uh, here you have another uh, situation where getting somebody's case history is, is relatively important. Uh, you can see she, it's a girl brought in by her mom. Uh, she's having some uh, abdominal cramps and um, she kind of just wondering what's going on. She thought she had an accident uh, in her underwear and, and saw something that looked a little bit like an earthworm. Um, Nothing remarkable with the travel history. Uh, didn't find anything, you know, so what's going on, right? So you can see there's some questions here. I don't think I have any room to really fill in some of the answers here, but first one, it says, what is, oops, what is a nematode? So a nematode is something SpongeBob does not like. Uh, nematode is a uh, unsegmented roundworm. So it says here, which parasite is probably found in the patient? So that's the question, which one looks like the, um, an earthworm? And that one is Ascaris, also known as the giant intestinal uh, roundworm. So next question, what population in Canada is this most likely to occur? So um, like a lot of these parasites, uh, it's uh, spread by, uh, human fecal matter that is being used as fertilizer. So we're not doing that in Canada, or at least most of us are not. Um, so we're looking at people that have either traveled or immigrated to Canada and have gone to areas where that's a bit more common. So probably this girl was uh, born in another country would be my guess, um, somewhere warmer, somewhere uh, less prosperous than Canada, uh, where they, they have to use fecal matter as, as fertilizer and uh, probably has been infected for most of her life uh, since she was eating solid food. And, uh, and it's, just, it's just at the point now where uh, it's being noticed. So that kind of leads into the next question, you know, what determines the severity of the disease? Uh, kind of the number of worms. Uh, so if I remember correctly, like I said, I think it's 100 or 200 worms. So uh, we can tolerate up to about that many before we start having cramps or, or blockage or, or those kind of things. Other than that, a uh, person can live relatively asymptomatic and not even know that they're infected um, until the worms get detected. So anyway, yeah, worms, they're very fascinating, often very creepy. <laughs> That's not fun at all, right? And um, that's kind of it for worms. So I think that's the last slide here. Uh, other than this one, just wanted to show you uh, uh, kind of some of the numbers. This is from the textbook. And um, 
let me just take a look at this here. So uh, these are some of the higher numbers of, of things. So I'm just gonna put some stars besides some of these, oops, just go back. So I'll put some stars beside some of these and uh, let's see here. There are more, but uh, those ones there that have put stars beside are things that are transmitted in Canada. Uh, most of the rest of them are gonna be imported from, from other countries. Um, so just something to think about. You can see the numbers though, Ascaris, uh, according to the textbook, we're looking at 2 billion people. I've read 1 billion in a couple uh, sources, could be 2 billion, uh, we don't know. But it's, it's something like that, right? Um, you know, using human fecal matters fertilizer, uh, that is possibly a third of the humans on the planet. Um, and we are getting close to 8 billion. So that kind of adds up, right? Um, a third of 8 billion is, uh, you know, 2. Uh, maybe 2.8 or something like that billion people. So who knows? It's just an estimate. But anyway, kind of scary, kind of creepy, all those kind of things. Okay, so that is it for worms. I would love to go on uh, much more about worms, but we do have other things to talk about. So we are going to move on to topic six. And uh, let me just load that up here. And then I'll share the slide. So, uh, okay, where's the share function? There we go. All right, so we want to kind of talk about viruses, but I'm just um, I'm just kind of looking ahead at the calendar here, and uh, so just a quick reminder that we are um, I think we're exactly two weeks away from our midterm, and so I will be talking about the midterm more um, next week, uh, but uh, it will cover topics one to six. So. Topic six here is, is a big topic. We're uh, probably not going to quite finish it today. We might have to spill over to next Tuesday. But uh, just in terms of where we are with the material, I thought I would just give you the heads up that the midterm is coming up. I will try to uh, get around to it today. I have a sample midterm to post. And uh, in terms of the COVID restrictions and all that, I, I don't know yet what the format of the midterm is going to be. I'm hoping I'm going to have some answers for you by the end of this week or, or early next week uh, so we can plan for that. But uh, just stay tuned with, uh, you know, the college is giving, uh, trying to send out communications regularly. And I think they're trying to figure it out too. So try to be patient. Um, I will hopefully uh, find some answers for you. Someone says, do you have a study guide for the midterm? What topic is the mid? Okay, so midterm is topics one to, one to six. And um, study guide, I have study questions at the end of every unit. And that's kind of my study guide. Uh, I will, like I said, provide you with a sample midterm, and um, that's uh, that's kind of what uh, I have for you to study off of. And uh, we can talk a little bit more next week. I will have some extra material uh, to, to put up on Moodle, and uh, I'll see about if I can get that up by the end of the week, just so you have a little extra time to study with that. So let's talk about viruses. Um, everyone's been talking about viruses. Uh, you know, other than the fact that it's a pandemic, that's exciting for me because I love talking about viruses. And uh, um, I just wish more people asked me more questions because I have, I have tons of knowledge to share with people about viruses. So how can we introduce viruses? And uh, this is kind of where I start. Um, you know, I, I ask people, do you, do you think you've ever had a viral infection? And um, most people know the answer to this, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, most of us have been sick at some point and um, with some sort of infection, and they presume it's a virus. If you don't know which ones are viruses and which ones are not, that's what you're here for in this class. Um, the next question I ask people is, have you ever had a herpes infection? And, um, and of course, no hands usually go up. <laughs> um, but um, that's okay, because I'm here to tell you that all of you have been infected by a human herpes virus at some point in your and probably still are. So let me tell you why that is true. So here are uh, human herpes viruses. So you can see, I actually have, there's, there's eight that regularly infect humans. So you can see HHV1, that stands for human herpes virus one. And I want to uh, introduce you to some of these. Um, so you may have heard of these first two, herpes simplex one and herpes simplex two. 
um, these will cause cold sores and genital herpes. So um, herpes simplex one usually causes cold sores and herpes simplex two usually causes genital herpes. Um, but both viruses can actually cause uh, um, sores in, in both locations. Um, so it, it's possible, right? And so you can see on the right, the prevalence of these viruses. So about 60% of people worldwide have uh, herpes simplex one. And about uh, maybe 10 to 20% have herpes simplex two infected worldwide. Uh, so these are pretty common infections. And if you've had cold sores or genital herpes, you know that they kind of flare up once in a while um, and they kind of suck. Uh, some people are infected and they don't even know it. Uh, and the virus is basically hiding uh, in, their, in their nerve ganglia and whatnot. So I'm telling you right now that there's uh, a possibility, at least 60%, maybe more, that you have at least one of these, whether you like it or not, those are herpes viruses. <clears throat> Um, the other thing about herpes viruses to know is that they are lifelong infections. So if you have cold sores or genital herpes, um, you, you have it for life, unfortunately. So if you don't have one of these, um, there's a very good chance you have one of these. Um, so we have varicella zoster virus that causes uh, chicken pox and shingles. Um, so 95% prevalence. Um, most people uh, used to get this. Uh, by the time you were 12 years old, you had a 95% chance of getting it. Um, with the vaccines, uh, I'm, I'm assuming all of you are, are young enough that, uh, or at least most of you are young enough. Um, probably if you're around, uh, I would say, uh, I think the age is around 21 or 22. So if you're younger than that, uh, there's a very good chance you've had the vaccine. If you're older than that, uh, the vaccine was around, but it wasn't necessarily provided for by Alberta Health. Um, but so I don't know how the vaccine is going to change that prevalence. But it used to be, like I said, that 95% of us got it by the time we we're age 12. Um, there's also Epstein Barr virus. This causes infectious mononucleosis. So this is something that by the time you're 30, you've had a 95% chance of having it. Uh, and you may not have had symptoms, um, but once you're infected, you're infected for life. So if you haven't had uh, the herpes simplex viruses, very good chance you've had one of these other herpes virus infections. And if you haven't had any of those, if you're one of the very rare people that have never had one of the herpes viruses one, two, three, and four, um, there's a very good chance you've had some of these. This one here, uh, roseola virus, uh, is super common. Um, and uh, it's uh, sometimes called baby measles. And uh, pretty much 100% of us get it when we're kids, as far as we can tell. Uh, sometimes it's a mild fever. Sometimes it's not even detected. Other times uh, they get a little bit of a, a pinkish, almost a rash on the, on, on the skin. And um, it's, it's never usually uh, very serious, unless you're immunocompromised or something. Uh, these other ones, too, are, are a little bit more common. And um, you hear about them with immunocompromised individuals, people with uh, transplants and surgery and things like that. Uh, but most of us get these infections and it doesn't really amount to much, uh, mild or, or no disease. So bottom line is that uh, everybody here has probably had two, three, four or more herpes virus infections in their lifetime. And um, they're, they're, infect, they're infected for life. Um, and uh, hopefully no complications. Um, you may notice there's one more virus on this uh, list called the B virus, the herpes B virus. So I'm assuming none of you have had this because this one is 100% fatal. <laughs> uh, this comes from monkeys and, um, and, and humans who get it, uh, like I said, 100% fatal, no treatment for it. And uh, it's very, very, very rare, uh, but happens once in a while. And uh, um, like I said, 100% fatal. So kind of interesting uh, introduction to viruses and kind of the whole idea I'm trying to tell you here is, is viral infections are super common. And uh, in many of these cases, um, you, you may not have even been sick. So a few other virus facts that I wanna share with you today. And uh, somebody's asking, do we need to know this table? Uh, the answer is the first four we're gonna be talking about. Um, so numbers one, two, three, and four, you need to know. So we'll come back to those in the next, uh, next lecture. So first virus fact, viruses infect every living thing. 
at least that we know of. Uh, it seems wherever we look and uh, whatever species we're looking at, whether it's a plant or an insect or a koala bear or whatever, we find at least one virus that infects that organism. Um, so they're very, very common. Uh, we are exposed to billions daily. We breathe air that has virus particles in it. Uh, if you um, eat food, uh, for example, if you have a salad today for lunch, um, that salad, uh, those vegetables are gonna have plant viruses on them. They're gonna have viruses that infected the insects that used to walk on those plants when they were in a, in a farmer's field and so on. Um, our bacterial gut is loaded with, or our gut is loaded with bacteria and those bacteria have viruses that infect them. So these things are everywhere. Um, there are so many viruses, uh, you know, on, on the planet. Um, and the, the number is staggering. We can't, nobody can count that high. Uh, if you look at it, you know, people look at seawater and all sorts of things and find viruses everywhere. So um, here's the thing, kind of the bottom line about viruses is that uh, we are exposed to billions a day and most of them have little or no impact on our health. Um, because they're designed for infecting, let's say, insects or, or infecting plants. And then on top of that, we have amazing immune systems. And so most viruses have, uh, you know, they're, they're, we're not even noticing them. And uh, this is something I find very fascinating. Uh, and, um, you know, we'd love to spend a lot more time about talking about all these viruses doing out there in the oceans and whatnot. But uh, we're going to focus on the ones that do make us sick because there are a few nasties out there and a few very nasties out there that um, are just uh, horrible to live with. So let's talk about what a virus is for starters, because uh, they don't have cells. And uh, so what exactly are they? And here's a definition from a microbiology textbook, uh, Bauman's Microbiology. And uh, I just want to kind of dissect that a little bit. And it says they're minuscule acellular infectious agents having one or several pieces of nucleic acid. But let's just start off with this minuscule because this is something that always amazes me how small viruses actually are. And I found this, uh, um, some information for you. I'll, I'll show you a graphic if, if this information is just, it's just numbers in some ways, but I'll try to, try to show you how small they are. Um, so if you look at a human cell, uh, typical size, typical genome size, uh, 3.2 uh, billion base pairs, um, 20,000 or so genes. If we look at something like E. coli, uh, we're looking at uh, something that's smaller physically, uh, less genes, maybe four to 5,000. A virus, we're looking at, you know, 10, 20 genes, you know, it's kind of typical, uh, much, much smaller. But looking at these numbers, you're probably wondering, okay, it's kind of hard to imagine a micrometer, never mind these nanometers. So I found this cool thing on the internet from uh, Cells Alive. I kind of adapted it. I wanted to show you how small these things are. So there's something that you can probably imagine as a pin and uh, a dust mite. So, and then one more thing is a strand of hair. So I mentioned a strand of hair because that's kind of the smallest thing the human eye can see in terms of the uh, thickness, right? Anything smaller than that, uh, the human eye, uh, you know, we just don't have the resolution to be able to uh, see anything thinner. So a red blood cell compared to a strand of hair is about 10 microns, so one tenth of the, the thickness of a strand of hair. So it's too small for the eye to see. And compared to that strand of hair, it looks like a speck. So let's zoom in on that red blood cell and compare that to a virus, so a rhinovirus. And so that red blood cell is about 10 micrometers and that rhinovirus is 0 0.02 micrometers. So a rhinovirus is a very small virus, by the way, it's one of the smaller ones. So at this point, I usually ask people, what do you think a rhinovirus infects? And um, immediately somebody puts his or her hand up and says, a rhinoceros. So that's a very good guess. You can see in the name, rhino. But uh, then I usually ask, um, what is a rhino, you know, what, what is what's something distinctive about that animal? And, and, you know, somebody usually eventually says something about the big nose it has. And uh, that's actually what rhino means, nose. So rhinovirus is something that infects your nose. And this is actually the most common cause of the cold, is the rhinovirus, the common cold. 
So they infect us. Most people get at least one or two rhino infections, uh, rhinovirus infections a year. And, uh, you know, we have some sniffles. Sometimes it lasts for a short time. Sometimes it's a few days and they're very annoying. Um, rarely cause serious illness. So compared to a red blood cell, the rhinovirus looks like a speck. So how many would fit on that pin? About 500 million rhinoviruses would fit on that pin. So uh, if you have uh, a rhinovirus infection, a one sneeze, apparently is something like 10,000 viruses will come out in that sneeze, uh, which means you could infect 10,000 people in theory, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is really crazy. I want to show you one more a graphic. Uh, this was on the internet. Um, a mathematician was trying to calculate uh, you know, the size of the coronavirus. Coronaviruses are, are um, bigger than rhinoviruses, but if you calculate how many people are currently infected right now and roughly how many viruses they can estimate are in, uh, in one human body, uh, it would not even be the volume of a can of Coke. Uh, so these things are very, very, very tiny viruses. So they're small, they're minuscule. All right, so um, before we get more into viruses, I wanted to talk a little bit and come back to these things here. And because uh, understanding um, a little bit about these processes is important to understanding, um, is an important to understanding how viruses work. So remember way back in the first week, I told you you should know what these things are, replication, transcription, and translation. And I'm just going to review them in a little bit more detail today. Not a ton, just a tiny bit of detail. And I'll make some notes on them. So first one is uh, DNA replication. And uh, let me just uh, find something here, a file, because I'm wondering if I uh, got a little video I was going to play here for you. But I um, can't remember if I, I remember if I got those video files or not. Um, so DNA replication. Uh, this is where you have DNA is copying itself. And uh, let's see if this video will play here. It doesn't play on, I've got a little gra uh, sketch I'll make for you. So there's, um, there's a video, hopefully it's playing on your screen. You have a double strand chunk of DNA and the strands separate. And then that is used to make some new DNA. And now you have two strands. So that's kind of it, it's just a short video there. Oh, hold on, no, it's still playing, Never mind. And I think what it's just showing is you got the two strands, they're very beautiful. And then I think at some point it's going to show your, uh, your base pairs. So hopefully you can remember that from high school that DNA has some base pairs on the line. Let's see here. There we go. We have T and A and G and C. All right, so what I'm going to do is, um, I think I'm gonna make a sketch for you anyway. So let me just switch here and where is my, there we go. I'm hoping that this is being shared with you. Uh oh, sorry, that's the one I want. Okay. No, this is not the one I want. Where is my, I started a sketch. Just can't seem to find it. Well, let me pull it up here. Okay, there we go. So I wanted to draw for you a little sketch that shows how DNA replication works. Okay, so DNA replication. And uh, what I'm going to do is represent my DNA kind of like this. There's two strands of DNA. Okay, so this is my double-stranded DNA. So during DNA replication, first step is that these strands separate. So write that strands separate. All right, so here are my separated strands. And then maybe the most important thing to know is that um, we have an enzyme that comes along and uh, it's important to know the name of this enzyme. This name, enzyme is DNA polymerase. 
what does DNA polymerase do? It adds new nucleotides. So now we have um, two over here, two strands of single stranded DNA. So usually I do this on the whiteboard. Um, apologize, my writing on the whiteboard is a little better on the computer screen. It's, it's I'm, I'm trying. Uh, I, all I know is that Soren, our chemistry instructor, his handwriting is much worse. So I'm not going to apologize for Soren because uh, he really does need to work on it. Uh, so here's my uh, my previous strands, right? And I'll, I'll do the new nucleotides in green. And it's going to look something like this. So here we have, we have two strands of double-stranded DNA. So one more note you probably know is that A pairs with T and C pairs with G. This is a T. So that's kind of DNA replication in, in a nutshell. Um, come back to it in a minute. I'll, I'll show you an example. I'm going to give you an actual uh, nucleotide sequence, um, just a very short one, uh, so that we can see this kind of in um, in application. All right. So I see there's a question here. Somebody says there's a really good Khan Academy video on this. Yeah, there's some great Khan Academy videos out there, aren't there? And um, He's much uh, better at uh, drawing on the computer screen than I don't know that. He's very neat and tidy and, and uh, has it well organized. All right, so uh, back to PowerPoint. Where's the PowerPoint? There it is. Uh, the next one to talk about is transcription. So like I said, I wanna kind of define all these and then, uh, and then give you an example. And um, so uh, transcription, is where the, uh, the DNA is used now to make a strand of RNA. So some of the same rules, we're still pairing our nucleotides, uh, except for this time we're not using the T, we're using U. So A would pair with U instead of T, C with G. And why is that? Because RNA is actually a different molecule. And so there are some small kind of chemical differences that aren't worth really mentioning in this class. But uh, you're, you're making RNA, RNA is single-stranded, and uh, kind of the key thing to know is that the enzyme here is RNA polymerase. So like I said, I'll show you guys an example in a minute. I'm not gonna play this video here. I'm just a little bit behind time and it's just kind of more flashy than anything. But uh, like I said, I, want, I do want to give you guys an example in a minute. And the last step to know is translation. And translation happens at the ribosome. So the ribosome is, um, I hate to call it an enzyme, but basically a giant enzyme with a bunch of other things going on on it. And uh, this is going to take that messenger RNA and it's going to uh, convert it. So now we're not in nucleotides anymore, but we're, we're converting it to the language of amino acids. And uh, there are lots of videos on translation on the internet if you want to you know, check them out. I'm not gonna go into all the details there. But these are kind of the things I want you to know, right? A definition of what these processes are and what is making the whole thing happen. So DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, and the ribosome. So as promised, I'm going to uh, show you an example. And I have, uh, again, I usually do this on the board. And what I've done is I've, I've started this whole thing in a Word document. So if you take a look, there's a strand of DNA. Okay, you may notice I have this five prime and three prime stuff. That is only stuff that you should care about if you care about chemistry. And uh, I'm not going to get into what all that is. You can ask me about it any time though. And so we have two strands. And so of course my A is gonna pair with a T and uh, I'm just gonna complete the second sequence here. My T pairs with an A, G pairs with a C, T with an A, C with a G, T, C, G. So what I'm doing here, is uh, basically doing what the, um, what the DNA polymerase had done, right? The uh, DNA polymerase that was making the new strand of DNA. And uh, I made the second strand. So there's my DNA. And uh, what I wanna do is kind of just go through the processes of, uh, of transcription and uh, 
and um, translation. So first step is the transcription. And uh, as mentioned before, this is done by RNA polymerase. So before I get to the transcription, I want to talk about this DNA strand for a minute. And uh, one thing that uh, is important to know is up here. And uh, this is something that uh, if you're in one of my other classes, we would go into this in a lot more detail. But th this is the start codon. So you may know a bit about the start codon, and maybe you don't. I won't ever ask you about the start codon on my tests. But uh, the start codon is important because it tells the ribosome where to start. So when I see the start codon, it means that that particular strand, and this is important for viruses, we call this the plus strand. Some reason, oh, there we go. And then the other strand is the minus strand. So you'll see that kind of terminology when we talk about viruses, and yeah, plus strand and minus strand. And we're gonna to get to that, uh, maybe not today, we'll see. Uh, and um, we'll see what that means in a bit more detail. But there's two strands of DNA. So you gotta give them a name. So viruses, virologists call them the plus strand or the minus strand. What's the difference? The plus strand is where the start codon is. So if you know lots about genetics, you know what a start codon is, maybe that's helpful. So transcription, this is where the RNA polymerase is going to make a new strand, okay? Uh, just one strand of RNA, and actually you can call this mRNA if you want for messenger RNA. And uh, so what happens is the RNA polymerase comes along and uh, I thought that was all gonna be red. So you have five prime, hmm, somehow I changed the color. Let me, let me change that back to red. I like to have things, I like to have my colors coordinated. Um, helps me, uh, you know, I like learning uh, visually. So there we go, that's in red. So the RNA polymerase comes along and it's going to basically, um, it, it's, it's going to make a, a single strand of RNA. And that single strand of RNA, in fact, looks a lot like the, um, uh, the plus strand. So you can see there's the first three letters, A-U-G. So remember in RNA, we have uracil instead of thymine. So the U instead of the T. And then everything else looks like the plus strand except for I'm changing all my T's into U's. So it's gonna look like this, A-U, almost lost my spot, um, A-G, there we go. So that's what my messenger RNA is gonna look like. And that is done by an RNA polymerase. All right, so I'm going to move down a little bit here. Maybe I can make a little more space up top like that. And the last step, probably you're predicting, is going to be translation. And translation is done at the ribosome. So just get my color coordination back in there. Looks like I'm doing my protein in purple. So let's get that purple back for the ribosome. There we go. So what's going to happen here at the ribosome? Well, the ribosome is going to look at this um, RNA. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to break this into triplets. So when you have three base pairs together, when you have three uh, nitrogen spaces, we call these codons. And uh, inside the cell, they have uh, something called the transfer RNA that is going to read these codons and figure out uh, basically what each of these is. So I actually have a genetic code down here. And uh, so we can actually read this off the genetic code. So if you take a look uh, right here, AUG. So that's actually gonna be my first amino acid. My first amino acid is something called methionine. So MET is the, the abbreviation for methionine, by the way. Uh, I, just, I just know all the, the codes. Uh, UCA, I gotta find that one. So UCA, it looks like it's right here, which is serine. So serine. Okay, maybe I'll leave some spaces in between those and try to line them up with the appropriate codons. All right, GCA. So you can probably see where this is going. Uh, GCA is down here. And that would be alanine. And then UAG is right here. UAG is the stop codon. So there's no amino acid named stop. 
uh, that's it. So this is just a very short peptide, uh, three amino acids total. Uh, just want to do a simple example for you. And like I said, you know, the things that I want you to know is really, uh, you know, what are these processes? What is transcription? What is translation? And what is doing that? So RNA polymerase is doing it over here for transcription and the ribosome is doing it for uh, translation. All right, so hopefully you're gonna find that useful for understanding viruses. I can see there's some questions here and uh, somebody is saying, is this gonna be posted on Moodle? I, I can post it on Moodle. Um, it's just gonna be a messy Word document, but I can certainly do that. Um, if I forget, please remind me, I can certainly pop it up there. It's not, not a big deal. All right, so back to our slideshow. And where is it now? Okay, right here, there we go. So it's important to know a little bit about these processes to understand what viruses are actually doing. And there's the genetic code. So back to what is a virus and uh, how does it work? And that's kind of what I wanted to address today. So they're very small. Uh, you can see they come in shape, different shapes and sizes. You can see compared to uh, E. coli, uh, some of them are like specks, others are a little bigger. You can see these smaller ones here. Uh, so the rhinovirus is about the same size as, as this is one here, the flavivirus. Flavivirus cause uh, yellow fever and Zika and a few other diseases. Um, kind of typical virus sizes, you know, these uh, HIV here, we're going to talk about that today, rabies, or next day, I guess we'll talk about, about these herpes viruses. Some of the bigger viruses are these uh, pox viruses, they cause smallpox and things like that. So they're very small. And I uh, want to talk about this acellular part and about having um, some nucleic acids. Um, so another thing to think about viruses is not having cells. So if you think about, um, you want to compare them to a bacterial cell, for example. Uh, first thing to know about viruses is that they live inside cells. So that's where they grow. Uh, for bacteria, that's not necessarily the case. Most bacteria, you can give them food and they can grow in a test tube or a petri dish or something like that. Uh, viruses are intracellular parasites. Um, there are some exceptions, some bacteria like chlamydia uh, do live inside cells, so there are exceptions. But of course, there's always exceptions in biology. Um, do viruses have membranes? No, um, maybe you could say sometimes, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But bacteria have plasma membranes, uh, and because they're cells and viruses do not. Uh, filterable. This is an old definition, and you still see it in textbooks. They talk about viruses being filterable agents, and that just means they're super, super small. Has both DNA and RNA? No. Uh, bacteria have DNA and RNA. Viruses do not. They have one or the other. Um, what about making ATP? Again, no. Uh, bacteria make ATP. They make and metabolize energy. Viruses do not. Do they have ribosomes? No. So you can see that they're they don't have these features that cells have. Uh, they're a lot more bare bones. What about sensitive to antibiotics? So usually when we say the word antibiotic, we mean drugs that are killing bacteria. And uh, so they're not gonna kill viruses. And uh, we'll get into that, what, what antibiotics mean in, um, in our uh, antimicrobial uh, unit. Last one, sensitive to interferon. Um, so that's a no, yes, this time. Uh, interferon is actually part of our immune system that attacks viruses. So much more on that uh, later on when we talk about the immune system. So let's just take a look at what a virus actually has in terms of its structure. So I mentioned that a virus is basically you have some DNA or RNA, um, and that's it. You have one or the other. Uh, you can have it being, um, double-stranded or single-stranded. So this is kind of weird. You can have single-stranded DNA and double-stranded RNA. Um, viruses can do some weird things. So you have some genetic instructions and they're basically packaged up in a protein code. So that protein code is called a capsid. Sometimes you might see the word capsid used and might be called a nucleocapsid, meaning it's surrounding the nuclear material or something like that. But capsid is, is the main word that we use for the protein code. And and, and that's kind of it um, for a lot of viruses. This is all they have, just these two components. So it's kind of like some genetic instructions that are packaged up and, uh, and ready to go. So not having any of the other side of the features. 
Um, some viruses are a little more fancy and they have something that we call an envelope. So an envelope is not quite a membrane, uh, but it's, uh, it's the phospholipids that are uh, obtained when that virus is budding away from the host. And uh, usually found uh, on that envelope are glycoproteins. Uh, and these are, are virus proteins. And sometimes um, in, in the case of the coronaviruses, we are calling these spike proteins, these uh, viral glycoproteins. So that's kind of it. Most viruses, uh, it's genetic instructions and they're packaged. And that's kind of it. And uh, different varieties and, and ways these things work. And I'll show you some different varieties of viruses. I have some, some to show you right now. So I'll show you some different styles of viruses. And, uh, um, and, and sometimes this is how we talk about viruses when we classify them. We might talk about a helical versus an icosahedral virus or something like that, right? Uh, so one type of virus are the helical viruses. And uh, really what you're looking at is uh, some genetic material. So you can see uh, both of these ones I think are RNA viruses. And uh, the genetic material is, uh, is packaged up by these capsid proteins. And, um, the whole virus itself is kind of like a big tube. So there's the tobacco mosaic virus. That was the first virus ever discovered by humans. And, um, and the Ebola virus. And the Ebola virus actually is really long and sometimes actually forms knots on itself. But uh, so that's one kind of virus structure. Another virus structure, a pretty common type are these icosahedral. So what does icosahedral mean? It means we basically have a bunch of triangles. So if you take a look at this, we have these capsid proteins. These capsid proteins kind of assemble uh, in, in these triangular shapes. And uh, so uh, if you have a, um, a small genome, um, you don't have a, a lot of triangles. If you have a bigger genome, you can, you can put more triangles together and make kind of a bigger shape. And, uh, and that's it. You have a virus and it's packaged up and it has its, uh, its uh, DNA or RNA packaged up. So adenoviruses and polioviruses are good examples of these. Uh, we're not really going to talk about adenoviruses, but we'll talk about polio uh, later on in the course. So over here, you can see this has some sort of spike protein as well. So maybe the most common type of virus that we see in, in uh, humans are these envelope viruses. Um, here are uh, examples of three that we're going to talk about in this unit. So HIV is human immunodeficiency virus, herpes viruses we've already talked about a little bit. And then, of course, we have the coronaviruses we're going to talk about uh, quite a bit uh, this term. So if you take a look at the herpes virus in the middle, you basically have a capsid surrounding a genome. And around that is, of course, this, uh, this envelope, which, like I said, is kind of like it's, a, it's sort of like a membrane. It's the phospholipids acquired when it escapes the host. And uh, it's going to have uh, all those uh, uh, glycoproteins and spike proteins on the outside that are part of the, um, the biology of the uh, virus. So more on these ones uh, next day. We'll be talking about uh, each of these in a little bit more detail on each of these. So one more last uh, category of viruses are the complex viruses. Um, this just means you have a virus that has extra bells and whistles and features, and it's just sort of a, a little fancier than your typical virus. Uh, for example, here's the smallpox virus. You can see it has a, a genome. It's got a DNA genome, and it's got a, a capsid, and it actually has a couple of layers of, of envelopes, which is kind of crazy, right? And then these other things, these lateral bodies, which I don't even know what they are. Um, so it's a lot fancier than, than your typical viruses. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is called a bacteriophage. Uh, this is a virus that infects bacteria, E. coli. And uh, you can see that the head is kind of like an icosahedral virus. It's got some DNA and, and it has a, a capsid packaging it. And then it has this giant tail. And this giant tail is kind of like a big syringe where it, uh, it's going to inject the DNA uh, into the host uh, cell. Um, so they're, they're just a little fancier. So we call these ones complex. And, uh, you know, of course, we have the, uh, the internet. And uh, I found this on the internet, right, when I was looking for a nice picture of a bacteriophage. And so, um, yay, go internet. People do some interesting things out there. So I want to just finish today off and talk a little bit about what viruses do. Um, 
So the big thing to know is that viruses have genetic material and genetic material is instructions. And the instructions say basically make new viruses. So it's the instructions for virus parts. So you have, uh, you have genes for capsid proteins, glycoproteins, sometimes genes for RNA polymerases, sometimes genes for uh, DNA polymerases. And, uh, and that's what viruses are doing. And so they're infecting cells and, and using that cell as a factory to basically make more viruses. So we'll talk a lot about how these things um, do what they do and how they, they cause disease over the next couple of lectures. So just wanna to finish today on how we classify viruses. Um, one way to classify viruses on, is on their type of nucleic acid. And uh, so you might talk about the virus being a DNA virus or an RNA virus, or maybe it's a single stranded RNA virus or uh, a double stranded RNA virus. And uh, so that's kind of one level of organization. Another is the replication strategy. Um, so do they enter the nucleus, do they stay on cytoplasm, uh, those kind of things. Uh, sometimes viruses are classified on their shape. So you can see this, uh, this little chart from our, uh, our um, textbook. It has, uh, you know, it's talking about you know, RNA virus or DNA virus, and then it's talking about the shapes, helical versus a cosyhedral and so on. And uh, sometimes, you know, are they uh, enveloped or non-enveloped? Um, sometimes we talk about viruses and how, what they infect. Is it an insect virus, a plant virus, a human virus, a bat virus, and so on. And um, sometimes we talk about the type of disease. There's, I'm not even sure, I think it's eight different hepatitis viruses. Uh, and uh, so they're not even closely related in terms of structure or anything like that. So I think what I'm trying to say is it's a bit of a mess. Um, <laughs> There is an international committee that discusses these things, and they were the ones who named SARS-CoV-1. Uh, and uh, so if you want some change, you can, you can join the committee. Um, but like I said, it is, it is a bit of a mess. So let me just peek ahead. I think that was where I wanted to, um, hold on a second, yeah. So that is actually where I wanted to finish off today's lecture. And uh, next lecture, what I'm going to do is, uh, is, is um, talk a little bit about more about uh, how DNA versus RNA viruses work and a little bit about animal viruses and some of the things that you need to do. And then we have, I think, six viruses that I focus in on in this unit. Uh, and so I want to discuss a little bit about the biology of, of each of those. Not sure we'll finish on Thursday. If, if not, we'll, we'll finish that uh, all on next Tuesday and, uh, and then we'll talk about the midterm as well. So that is it for today. So thank you for coming out. And uh, I will have this uh, recording posted um, to the, uh, the class playlist. So if anyone needs to review anything, uh, you can do that in the future. If you have any questions, please uh, contact me and, and let me know. Other than that, I will see you on Thursday.